podcast world. This is Caribbean Power Lunch, where we feature Black-owned businesses. I am your host, Kevin Valley, and I am still in Barbados. <laughs> Today, I am talking to a creative thinker who develops dynamic people Businesses, enterprises, and winning strategies. Did I get that? Did I get the quote right? Did yeah, I get you it right? did. You definitely did. Alian Olivier. Yes, please. That's Oprah. me. Yes, please. I love that. So, <laughs> tell me some. Why do Bajans say yes, please? I'm just hearing yes, please all week. I'm like, I please, what, like what do you want me to do? Be just polite, man. <laughs> okay. Polite. Polite. Okay, great, great, great. So, I am a girl, Barbados. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, what what is that about? So I Am A Girl is a not-for-profit that caters to girls 5 to 18. And it started with really the idea that we want to mentor, help to raise the capacity of girls. And I use my skills, my professional skills in that regard, and help to really build their confidence, help them to really see past the issues that they may have, and also to understand what being a woman means. And craft a life for themselves that they can be active citizens in in the world, in the Caribbean, in society here in Barbados and really build a sisterhood. Because typically in the Caribbean or rather in the world, females tend to tear down each other. Really? So building a culture where girls feel comfortable to be themselves, but also comfortable to lift up each other. Okay, so it's interesting that you say comfortable to be yourself because I'm looking. I was consuming some of your content. I was looking at some of your videos that you post on um, LinkedIn and yeah. and IGTV and stuff. And you see that you're very much yourself in it. Like I feel like I walked in here. I met you for the first time today. It's like I know her. What's up, Ali? And you know you're good. <laughs> yeah, man. You know you post any videos. Is no set of glam. There's no fancy dressing and all that. You just there. There's you're in the background. There's some bush. There's some bugs. I, th- I think I can't really bounce it on one of them though. <laughs> I, I, I was a little nervous for you. No. <laughs> but but you give you give your value right there. So like, is that part? Is that intentional or is it just that uh, I just care about it? No, it's intentional because part of my brand is making sure that I'm authentic at all times, but also part of my personality is helping persons to understand that you can be professional, you can have a lot of knowledge, but you don't need to put on the fluff to make it work. Um, I think generally in the Caribbean, we tend to feel like you have to look a certain way (laughs) to get opportunities or you have to be a certain way to appeal to the masses. And for me, that's not the case. I've been successfully creating opportunities for myself and connecting with people just off of being myself and knowing what that is because a lot of people are also not aware of who they are. That's a good point. I remember I was interviewing Kyle Maloney the other day. He's a he's a tech guy. Yeah. And he was talking about how the in the Caribbean any business setting, we always feel like we need to wear shoes and tie and everything. And he's like, Well, that's all about the post colonialism and all of that. Exactly. And on over on Become Investable, I interviewed my brother who, who's the CEO of um KCL Capital Market Brokers and the managing director of Aspire Fund Management Company. And I was asking him, right, so how do you define wealth? And part of what he said as the CEO and MD of an investment bank was, hey, no tie. Yeah. What's a tie for? You know? And me, myself, just going through my career as a banker, I always see people, you know, you see people in the office, you know, they all stiff and say, good morning, how are you doing? <laughs> and then you see them in the party, like, what? Yes, whiling out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like, what? Are you the same person? And that and that kind of scares me. Like, I can't, it's, it's hard to, connect with those kind of people because you're not sure what you're getting what getting, is their angle exactly. you're always you're always wondering what's going on but for me i'm like you see i'm here i'm getting out whatever it is i'm smiling this is how i'm in the office this right. is how i'm in meetings exactly you know this is how i'm in presentations whatever it is yeah it's true you know? so i and love it's a that shame, really it's yeah, a shame it is. that i feel like and and don't get me wrong there's kind of two sides to being professional right so there's the one side where you don't want to be too relaxed because you don't want to kind of disrespect whatever the space is, everything in reason, right? Correct. But at the same time, you shouldn't have to pull up yourself so high and trying to meet a standard that just isn't realistic. And for the Caribbean, we live in a hot climate, man. Why are we trying to be in suit and tie every single day like we are in England? It is not practical, you know? So 
It is I hear what it you. Is. I hear you. And in terms of it, it, just I mean, speaking about that, I know you spend quite a bit of time in London. Yeah. So London, so. That culture is a different culture. Right. But it helped me to realize that they appreciate the Caribbean. And it's, it's one of those things because we tend to go into that culture thinking that they see us in one way when in actual fact they really want to see the accent coming out and they want to hear and they want to see the colors in the office and they want to get the vibe of your culture from you. And when you try to dull that down by just fitting in, then you will never get the opportunities that you really want to get and you will never really propel as quickly if if you aren't yourself. And I learned that a lot in, in London. So tell me what you're doing in London or some. Tell me what you're doing in London that kind of set the foundation for you to be this creative thinker <laughs> who develops winning strategies <laughs> for business, people, and enterprises. So I started in England studying law. Mm-hmm. I actually left. I started in Barbados studying at the University of West Indies okay. and realized that it wasn't for me <laughs> the culture wasn't for me the what i was studying i really couldn't stand which was um management economics and something else i i really didn't care yeah that's all it. <laughs> it was yeah and um and then i also realized even in studying those courses like it wasn't a passion necessarily it wasn't something that i felt i could live doing this and be happy and for a year or so i decided to see what it is in the legal fraternity. I uh, created an opportunity for myself and went and worked in a law firm. Loved it. Loved going into court. Loved talking to people. You loved that? I loved... I used to fall asleep in court. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't court. It was more getting the story and behind the story, figuring out what the potentials, what the potential scenarios could be or how I could help somebody in that particular story figure out their life. Okay. That was more it for me than the court. Court court is, yeah. But this is, this is, is what, is. civil, tort, what is it? Yeah, so at that time, it was more family law at okay. the time and then also contract work. So from there, I decided I will apply to law school. Wasn't quite sure, got in, and that was great. And that really started our Propel, who I am today. Then right out of law school, I decided to work. So I went and I worked for the Royal Bank of Scotland. And as a consultant? Well, I worked, yes, as a consultant, but I worked for for customer relations and insurance. And that was awesome, man. That was <laughs> that was dynamic for me. That was crazy. I, I learned so much about myself. Really? So bank work was awesome. Tell me how. In the sense that it isn't your typical, <laughs> it isn't your typical behind the counter serving others. It was more, it was a different structure. And what was great about it was the people. So I got to learn a lot about team building. I learned a lot about customer service. I learned a lot about relationship management. It wasn't your typical job. And funny enough, here in the Caribbean, we are ten, we tend to be a nine to five bank bank service there is on shift so i could be at one in the morning at work doing whatever right so it's a different culture than here in the caribbean but it was awesome to me yeah okay okay and so that would have started you in terms of developing was it rap for upselling opportunities and, yes. and all that so that's part yeah, of your building systems and negotiating helping persons to get to their solution being creative and strategic, that that job required me to think on my feet. Mm-hmm. And n- no two days were the same, which is what I love. Awesome. And that's, and you're talking like eight, nine years ago? Um, About six, seven, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And you spent 10 years as a volunteer for the um, Cricket World Cup? <laughs> yeah, but um, that was an experience, man. Look, I love volunteerism. I've been volunteering from the time I was maybe seven years old due to my mom. And she always instilled in me giving back. And for her, it was more about service to others and making sure that you're not serving yourself along the way. I learned that principle from a very young age. So that 10 years specifically was more a learning curve, learning administrative stuff, learning how to 
think on my feet, learning creativity, because you have to be creative, and also helping volunteers to get to the next level. So, yeah. So, would you consider yourself an entrepreneur or somebody who's self-employed or some as a consultant how would you how would you classify yourself if you had to classify yourself i'm definitely an entrepreneur and why i class myself as an entrepreneur is because i take i take risks but i also am up for any challenge right and i take an idea transform that idea put it in the market and i i generate revenue from that and i also build opportunities for other people to do that as well so for me i'm not just i'm not just a sole trader <laughs> i am an entrepreneur who's serving others through also helping them to be employed okay okay so how that how did you get to that shift to entrepreneurship in barbados you know, after all that nice life in London, we can <laughs> bank and all these things. Like, how, how do we get there? Um, Honestly, it was coming back here and realizing that the opportunities that I felt like I could have gotten in England weren't here for me. And I started working at the UN. So when I first came back from London, a lot of my work was with the United, uh, the UNDP. Right. and i also un Nation. development program right and i also worked as uh under the united nations major groups of children and youth so I came, some again well no i was paid for that oh yeah <laughs> 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 but it was a combination of uh seeing my passion but also combining that with young people which is for me was the biggest thing and that kind of propelled me into entrepreneurship because i got to travel a lot i got to go to the un headquarters i got to hear about projects from all over the world and i realized wait these people doing some big things all over the world like why am i not like why are you thinking so small i felt like i came back from england although i was in the big city doing big things I came back from England still thinking like a small island girl. And for me, that it, that wasn't enough. So I just took that opportunity to decide, well, look, I'm going to create my own business. I'm going to do this consultancy. I'm going to help people to get to the point where they could get to. And I started it. You know, you, you say that, right? You, you, you're speaking and, I'm, and I'm, what I'm hearing is that there's no consideration of, hey, let me go get a safe job. Let me go save my money and all of these things. And then maybe do this on the side. And if that works out, then go into things. You're shaking your head. You're no. like, no, screw no. that. <laughs> I went all in. I came from London. I am here. If I'm coming here, I'm going big. Yes. Go big or go home. No, because listen, the safe thing for me to do was stay in London, get my whatever thousands per year and live great. That's safe. But for me, safe isn't enough. And I can't wake up every morning knowing that I'm creating someone else's dream. Like for me, I would rather eat some tuna and sardine and wake up and create my own dream and live a life that I really am going to be happy about living. I want to know where this comes from, Jed. Is this, is this, was your mom, were your parents entrepreneurs? Actually, no. <laughs> Up to maybe about five years ago, my mother would tell me, I got this nice little job post here in the newspaper. Right, right. <laughs> you could still apply, you know, even though you're doing your own thing, you could still apply. <laughs> she would still come and bring these things for me. But, and there's that mindset of get a good job, you no, know, get education, get a good job, live happy. I think I've had too much exposure around the world. Oh, that's it. And that exposure allowed me to realize, no, that's not enough. But the thing is, the exposure was you working for other people, though. Yes, but I realized through working for other people how I can do it myself. So uh -huh. it wasn't just about working for others. I think we we go and we are employees, but we don't learn the mechanics of a business while we are there, right? And for me, I t I soak up everything. I want. I went in the general manager office and I asked a lot of questions. I liaise with my supervisor i want to know what they do and why they do it 
I find out from some of the technicians, hey, this is how we answering the phones. This is the responses that we get here. Why we get this? I talked to the program directors to find out how the manuals were created that way. Because for me, I soak in everything. You never know. For me, knowledge is power. And you never know. I didn't know I was going to be an entrepreneur. But for me, if I take in this opportunity, I don't just want to learn my job. I want to learn everybody else's job too. Because what if I'm going to be the general manager next month? I want to know what he's doing so I know what to do too. You know, it's interesting. It's because a lot of us are employed and we, we are there soaking up knowledge as well. But there's something different in you. You have that, you have that bravery, that aggression. How do, we, how do we get to that? How do we get to that level of thinking where we say, you know what? I know this. I can do this. Yeah, I'm, I might be only 30 or so, but I'm going to do it anyway. How do we get there? Just I, swing for defenses. <laughs> anyway. I think a lot of it comes from what I experience, quite honestly, right? So I went to England at a time when I was this young, naive girl, not knowing what the world is about. And I was one of two black girls on my university, right? And... I had to quickly get my life together, right? So, and coming from a small island This as is well. in Canterbury, right? Yes, Canterbury, Kent. Right. So, imagine me, all my teachers can't understand my accent. <laughs> Ain't got a clue what I'm saying in class, right? And then everybody else is not black. Let me put it that way. And... I had to quickly get my life together. So, and what I mean by that is I had to learn very quickly how to face racism, how to face uh, the issue of gender in my class because it was he- it was a heavily male class, dominated class. And I learned very quickly how to defend myself. And defense doesn't mean attacking anybody or being aggressive or anything. Defense just meant learning how to adapt to that situation while still trying to maintain my sanity, right? And trying to maintain my culture, not losing who I was as a Bajan, a Bajan girl going in this big city. So I think that taught me that anything was possible because I went in there, I slightly adapted, can you go, please, right, right. to still get what you want in a, in a sense. And doing that adaptation, learning quickly that really and truly a lot of them are intimidated by us. They're actually fearful of our knowledge, fearful of how big we could really be. And that for me was powerful, knowing that they actually feel like, oh my gosh, Alian really knows what she's doing. That was powerful for me. So that kind of ingrained in my mind, I could do anything though. There's nothing that's stopping me from creating a business, making it successful and moving on. There's nothing. If I could do what I did in England, being the only black girl in that room, I could do anything in the Caribbean. That's interesting. So it sounds like identity is extremely important or important or paramount to you. I mean, your identity as not only a woman, not only as a black woman, but as a black Barbadian yes. woman. Yes, for sure. Okay. All right, so let's talk business now. Yeah. You know, we're all pumped up now. We're fiery. <laughs> Gateway International. Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> so what are these services you guys provide? How does it work? So Gateway International is a training and consultancy firm, and we offer uh, different packages for different uh, segments of, of uh, society. So on the personal side, we offer personal and professional development, brand management. Um, we help persons to really craft what their vision is and how they can maybe propel that, whatever it may be, personal or professionally. Then on the business end, we offer administrative services and or help persons to take their idea to market. Um, that could come through consulting with them on a one-on-one basis or helping to train them in the areas that they may not be great at. We harness a lot of our packages through the one-on-one consultations because that works best, especially for younger businesses, startups. So that's your target, the the, the startups and so the younger. That's one of the targets, but then on the flip in corporate, we help to get them to a place where they could scale. 
So there are some some teams, let's say it's 50 persons in that organization and they want to get to 100 employees. How do they do that through some of the systems or some of the programs that we will help to run them through? And also team building and customer service, because a lot of what we help organizations to understand is that you can't grow without the humans in your organization. So let us help you to build an environment or a culture that wants to help you to grow. Okay, but I'm listening to all these services that your company provides. It sounds like this company has about 80 people working there. So, <laughs> what, what, what's, your staff, what's your staff like? So there's about four to five of us who okay. work on in the team, um, some of which are consultants, some of which are more on the technical side, so help with um, putting together the documents and different things like that. Okay, okay, okay. And your your corporate clientele what's your what's your um, your track record with, with um your corporate clientele like well it all depends on on where they are based um a lot of my clientele are outside of the caribbean oh nice um so one of my major clients would have been the youth business international in london uh, and that pulls off of me having the experience in london and knowing the culture and um, being able to work with organizations like that and then a lot of our um a lot of our client base also comes from word of mouth. So persons like, look, we've worked with, with Gateway. They're amazing. Y'all need to work with them too. And that pass on. And the trend, the trend really continues based on that, yeah. You know what I love, Alian, is that you are sitting here in Barbados, but you're running an international business. Yeah. You know, that's the power of the internet. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, exactly right. And so you're, you're thinking big. You're thinking beyond the, your shores, beyond the Caribbean shores, internationally. I love that. And, the, and this is, this is also based on your relationships that you would have developed in London as well, right? Yeah, relationships there, but also relationships here. Because some persons here also do have international businesses and then they refer. Okay. So, Alian. Yes, please. All right. That's what <laughs> I wanted to say. <laughs> Alian, are you ready to get practical here? Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. So, you talk about, you say that you help people get their business started, right? Mm -hmm. All businesses start with an idea. Yes. Right. So I know you have five steps. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord. <laughs> no, I have the notes. I have the notes. I interviewed somebody you may know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh -huh. And he said his memory isn't all that good. Either. I have the notes. Right. The five steps for the business idea generation phase. I think that'll be very valuable for the audience to get. Mm -hmm. So I know the first one is being open minded. Can you just expound on that, please? Being open-minded really means not limiting yourself to any one idea and not limiting yourself to think that you have to you have to be in this particular sector or in this particular career. Because I feel like sometimes persons limit themselves. They don't really understand their strengths. They don't understand what their true skill sets are or even sometimes what they actually know that could be monetized, right? So being open-minded means don't don't come. What I don't want is that an entrepreneur comes and says, this is the idea. Yeah. I want you to come and tell me who you are. <laughs> I want you to come and tell me what you're about. I want you to come and tell me what your skills and knowledge is. And then let's devise that, that, that plan. Okay. So it's almost like a, a matrix kind of thing. So you have, you have maybe three rows. So who you are, what was the other two? Sorry. Who you are, mm -hmm. what you know, what you know, and who you know, and who you know, and your idea is where you have three lines that intersect across there. Okay, that's interesting. You know, um, so for for me, an, another another way is that maybe you list out your skills on one side, mm -hmm. or and you list your passions on the other side. Yeah. Right, and then maybe list out hey, what's missing on the other side. Now. Right. And they make that little TikTok. And it might also be helping persons to understand what their purpose is as well. Because I think a lot of people live, but they're living to get a paycheck and they're living to pay bills, but they don't really understand why they're here and what they're leaving. Oh, that's deep. Mm -hmm. That's deep. So you, I think you're talking about generations there. Are you <laughs> what are they leaving? I mean, what, why, are they, why are you really, what is it that you're leaving? Like when, when, you know, we, we do idea generation, but you you selling a, a pack of biscuits, for example. Okay, cool. Great. Mm -hmm. But anybody could go and buy those biscuits and sell them again, right? So what is making that 
pack of biscuits so so special right okay and then when i leave this let's say we leave this earth thank you jesus in about 50 years plus who's gonna carry that on and then on top of that or who's gonna remember that you sold that like who cares right so is is more about helping entrepreneurs to really get to the point where you are leaving something or leaving some mark some mark it doesn't have to be a huge mark but you're leaving some mark on the world so i think that you're speaking about thinking about a long-term vision yes when it comes to your idea generation yeah okay so your, your third point and i'm reminding you yeah? yeah yeah you say to talk to people talk to your potential customers yeah now i think one <laughs> We, we say we are entrepreneurs, right? But a lot of people have great ideas, yes. Um, not all of them are unique, fair enough. But how you going to know if you can make money if you don't talk to people that can buy? You know well, what I mean? Yeah, I want to say even further than talking to people is that you actually test the product. Because a lot exactly. of people would say, hey, what? Alien, I love what you're doing. I was going to try a Bajan accent for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Alien, I love what you're doing. Yes, please. I would, I would buy <laughs> But when you bring them the product and you tell them, hey, well, here's the price. Exactly. They're gone. Exactly. Or even finding out, look, is your price even high enough or low enough, for example? Exactly. Because you might go, or is that even your customer base? You see? Because a big thing about testing is also understanding, is this your target? And if this is not your target, keep it moving. But it's, it's the only way you're going to know is if you test. Love it, love it. All right, so I know you also say to be unique in your solution base, but I think we spoke about that just yeah. now. But the most, well, what's very important there is invest in yourself. Yes. Put some skin in the game. Does it. Be your first investor. Does it. Yeah. Why should I come to you and say, look, I'm going to give you 20 grand if you can't come to you and say <laughs> you're going to give you, you know. But if I don't have 20 grand. And that's fine. But you should, so what if you have $100? You know, why are you giving a hundred dollars to somebody else when you could be giving it to yourself and investing in yourself in some way, whether that's in some tool that you need, whether that's in some knowledge that you need, whether it's in, but you must show me that you're, if you have the confidence in you, then I will have the confidence in you. I agree. I agree. I agree. So what's next, Salian? What's next? And what is next? Gen think generationally, long-term vision. What's your next long-term vision? For Gateway International? Well, Gateway International specifically would be definitely having more trainers, consultants on board, um, having a hub in most of the major cities in the world, and getting to a place where we are licensing content and potentially franchising, um, franchising the model. So getting to a place where this intellectual property that is cultivated throughout the years is duplicated other places, but through licensing and franchising. That's Gateway's vision, right? Where Alian Oliver is nowhere near the business per se, but more so helping to manage the relationships. So essentially, Alian, what you're doing is you're building a system that could, a business system that could operate where Alian Olivier does not need to be there all the time. That's no. That's excellent. No. That's excellent. That's the aim. Because I want to be on a beat somewhere doing whatever I feel like. Um, and not feeling like I have to be in an office each day. But doing it because I love and want to be there, not because I have to be there. Okay. So this wasn't mentioned before, but you happen to be married to Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Fun <laughs> times. <laughs> yes. Mr. Gregory Skeets, who was just interviewed. Uh-huh. You know, it may have been released a week ago or so. Yeah. So how is that though? Like in terms of how do you all position your businesses? Because you both you both offer consultancy services, maybe to um individuals and businesses and stuff. But how does that I wanna say partnership work? Great. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to say to that? Listen, in every in every business relationship, whether marriage or friendship or whatever, is important to know what your strengths and weaknesses are and is important to cultivate that and harness it, right? So he is in a lot of ways more of a people person than I am. 
Mm-hmm. However, I am more of an intimate setting person, whereas he's more big room, big speaker, you know. Well, I'm sorry. So, I wasn't asking about your marriage. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I was asking how is, how is Gateway International? Right. So <laughs> I'm, I'm getting there, okay. Kevin. I'm getting there. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, he he we play off of each other, essentially. And it's a partnership in the sense that either we complement each other's content because he would have his own intellectual property and and or we combine content. So we create content together that works complementary to each other. So if he's focusing on leadership and I'm focusing on professional brand development, we can combine the two to ensure that it's a holistic package for whoever is de- being, it being delivered to. Okay. Um, but you also you also pretty big on partnerships, right? Because I know I saw you put out a post on where is it where to start when building partnerships. Yeah. So what sort of partnership do you get to? And how did, should people start in building partnerships? How should people uh, so think about partnerships? In right. Business? So there's two things to this, right? Because I believe that even an employee can be a partner, right? In the sense that if if an employee really thinks about it, they're really working with the company and not for the company. And if they have that mindset, then it would almost, they would almost have that entrepreneurial vision for the company to get it propelled or moving forward, right? On the other hand, as an entrepreneur, partnerships can vast up across various things. So whether it's your intimate internal team or as simple as the supplier, Who's, who's supplying something that feeds into your business, right? For me personally, in order to craft partnerships is not seeing competition, right? Because right. a lot of a lot of contracts that Gateway has or a lot of consultancies that I've done in the past, arguably they are my competition. They offer a particular service to a particular constituency, which is my constituency, but as opposed to seeing them as on the other foot, I see them more as if we are working together to achieve the same result, then we can create more impact as a unit. And that's, I think that is one of the key tips I would leave with an entrepreneur, not seeing competition, but more so seeing that you can craft just as much or even greater impact if you work together. Yes, yeah, so it's about focusing on serving, servicing the end customer. Exactly. Rather than servicing your pockets. Yourself. Awesome, yeah. awesome. So, Alian, I'm going to give you open mic, mm-hmm. open forum. Oh, dear. Open platform. <laughs> hey, you can handle it. <laughs> to leave us with anything that you feel that we haven't covered today that you want to make sure that you get across. Um... Well, two things I will leave with any person who's listening, feeling like you want to be an entrepreneur or you are already an entrepreneur, but you feel lost. And the two things would be learn a little bit more about yourself as an individual. If you know more about yourself and know more about what you have to offer, what your real passion is in life, you will never work a day in your life. And I know that sounds cliche, but is the truth. You would actually wake up with ideas churning and everything. And the second thing I would say is be as authentic as you could possibly be because you'll, you'll realize that opportunities are going to come your way that you didn't even think about that. You didn't even, you can't even foresee in no way, shape or form. And that's going to come from being genuine with others, being genuine about who you are and, being being the kind of person that people will be drawn towards because a big part of entrepreneurship as well is building connectivity and you can't start as a startup doing it on your own in any case you might be a sole proprietor but you have a whole ecosystem around you if you really think about it right and the only way you're going to get to the next level is if you have connections with others and that's going to come from being authentic and that would be the two things I will leave. If if nothing else, those two things will help any person to propel themselves. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know what? I'm listening to you, Ali, and I could tell you're a very strong person. I'm not going to say strong woman, right? <laughs> a, very, yeah. a very strong person who knows exactly who you are and what you're about. I, I wanted to wrap, but I have one more question. Okay. What 
is your favorite failure story? My favorite failure story. Oh gosh. Um my favorite failure story, I think I I slightly mentioned it earlier, uh which was failing out of university. And it was one of those biggest things cuz you know you get the whole hallelujah Oh my gosh, you get university and the whole family into this whole thing. And they were like, yes. And it's almost like a milestone that you are setting for the family. Because I think in my whole family, I was maybe the second first, the second person to go to university, right? So it was a huge deal. And almost six months in, I realized I really couldn't stand. I couldn't stand the teachers. I couldn't stand the people. I couldn't stand the culture. I couldn't stand anything. I didn't go into class. Most of my time, honestly, and this is maybe my first time admitting this, but most of my time at, at UE was being in the gill, going to parties, <laughs> you know, and getting so wrapped up in that world that I kind of forgot or didn't really, wasn't really interested in the studying part of it. Um, but that came down to not really loving the subject as well, right? And I kind of failed out at university. And I sent him my the resignation letter to the dean. And I decided after a year I was over it. But I can, of course, tell my mother that. Yeah, 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 ma. <laughs> Mommy expected me to come home with good grace. Like, what do you yes, mean? Please. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Um, so I decided one day that I'm going to make a plan B. And that plan B for me was I call every law firm in Barbados. I decided law was my thing, but I wanted to learn before I went into another degree. And I literally sat down with the phone, but one day, A to Z, call every place, said, look, I don't know if you can pay me. I don't need to be paid, but I want to work for you for a year. I want to learn the ins and outs of law. I want to be in court with you next to you. What's going to happen? And maybe I got 15 people who said, okay, sure. Out of maybe a thousand lawyers in Barbados, 15 people said, okay, send in your CV. Let me have a look at it. And by the end of those couple days of calls, I had maybe three interviews. By the end of the first interview, I had a job. What? A paying job at that. Because actually, the attorney that I worked with said to me, Never going to interview again saying you don't want money. And that lesson of that failure stuck with me because when she said never going to interview again saying you don't want money, your time is valuable. I said, what? That was the first lesson I learned from that failure. And I have never forgot it since then. And honestly, it's one of those things that I try to even instill in other entrepreneurs Oh, this thing about uh, exposure. Oh, you can get a lot of exposure <laughs> from this particular. Um, you can get a lot of exposure from this expo. Come, just showcase your work. You, it can be exposure. Exposure don't pay the bills. So for me, that lesson kind of propelled me into entrepreneurship and realizing, look, even if you get five cent, you have to be paid something for your time and energy that you're putting into this particular idea. Podcast world. <laughs> Alian Olivier. <laughs> it was a pleasure being here, man. Yes, yeah, same here, same here. Subscribe to Caribbean Power Lunch at CaribbeanPowerLunch.com slash subscribe. Check us out on Castbox, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And with that, Podcast World, Barbados, we are out. Mic drop. <laughs>